Hello, you're listening to the Midiera Meets podcast. And this episode, we're talking to Pendle Poucher of Sound Dust. Pendle creates all kinds of fantastical instruments uh, for contact using real world organic sounds and combining them with the modern technology of contact to create instruments that we literally couldn't have in real life. He's made all kinds of things and I caught up with him only a few weeks ago to discuss what he makes and the first question I asked him was about his musical beginnings. Interesting question. Um, I remember hearing, actually it was hearing sounds first that I really liked and there were things, there was, and I know it really well, Journey to the Bottom of the Sea or something like that. I say I know it really well, I can't remember what it's called. It was a program about, it had a submarine and they had the sonar ping. I absolutely fucking loved <laughs> as a kid and I've spent my whole life trying to recreate that, that sound which I managed to do actually by pinging a hamster cage, which was very as close as I've ever come to that thing. But um, yeah, so I definitely started off liking kind of sounds first, kind of um, little earworm sounds, and then totally got into music, uh, I don't know, in my early teens, and got a guitar and start my, started my first band a week later, and then was just like, yeah, this is, this is much better than anything else I was likely to be doing. Mm-hmm. And I've kind of... Um, done everything I can never to have a proper job since then and to kind of do anything related to making noises be it music noises or noises basically mm. and what do you think it was about the submarine the radar ping I don't know sound? The, it was possibly because I loved I, I made made possibly had a seven year old crush on the lead lady in the program as well but there was maybe it's a kind of weird psychosexual thing as well <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was I don't know, there was just something, it had a, just a quality that I'd never really heard before and it just was really fascinating to me. And then um, a Marine Boy, there was this Japanese animation called Marine Boy, which was all water-based as well, which, which just had really great sound design. And it's still, I think you can find, I did look it up recently, it's on YouTube. I mean, mm-hmm. no, I'll give my age away a bit. Um, so this would be in the 70s, I suppose, when I was a kid. And... Uh, and, you know, because stuff was a bit crap, really. Although you had, you know, occasional amazing pop music, like um, David Essex, Rock On. It's an amazing sounding record, you know, even today. And at the time, it was kind of mind-blowing. And then, you know, you start getting uh, uh, kind of uh, Autobahn by Kraftwerk kind of was in the charts and various stuff like that. So there was kind of early electronic music. And, um, but yeah, also... You know, I got a guitar. Was this was kind of I was a kind of just about old enough to be a really, really, really junior punk as well. So it was that whole thing, which was you know, it's corny to say it, but it was quite life changing in the sense that it was like, you know, I'm not a posh kid who's done music lessons, but God, I can do music, and it was an absolute, absolute amazing kind of like opening of like, wow, so I can do music, mm. and. That was it, really. Yeah, and and I guess also expressing yourself and sort of establishing who you are yeah. as a person. But yeah, and that, and you know, I was I was a you know firmly addicted to. I got all the music, well, the good music press, Enemy and Melody Maker every week, and kind of you know knew everything about everything. I had a encyclopedic knowledge of all music from the kind of eighties onwards for a while. And uh, sorry, I'm drinking coffee. Go for it. But yeah, sorry. Yeah, and just to go to Marine Marine Boy, is this a animation? Is it? Yeah, it's a kind of a, it's an anime before we knew what anime was. Oh wow! And in my mind, it was brilliantly weird and freaky, and kind of like, what the hell are we watching this for? Kind of a thing. But maybe it's terrible. I don't know. But I don't think it was. It was something weirdly magical and kind of Japanese about it, which, if you're in the East Midlands in the seventies, was just like quite mind blowing. Yeah. And. Um, because uh, I mean, I mean, it, instantly when you mention the sound effect of the radar, I'm thinking Thunderbirds in my head. Yeah, yeah. When I was a child, and they always did have the cool, like some. Cool uh, well, th- I think that yeah, there was uh, there was also Captain Scarlet had the, the, the voice of the Mister Ons and just thing, which was really great as well. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, so yeah, now my ears were always kind of pricking up to kind of great noises from that period of my life. 
Cool. And where where in the East Midlands did you grow up? I came I come from a small village in the which is between Nottingham and Lincoln. I can see Lincoln from my village, mm-hmm. and um, but Nottingham was weirdly closer. I'm not sure why. But so yeah, brought up in this kind of absolute. Sorry, East Midlands, but an absolute sh- shithole. <laughs> you know, no one goes to the unashamedly <laughs> borders of Nottingham and Lincoln unless they really need to. But that does give you a kind of a whole, you know, I was a whole different kind of. You're used to being an outsider because you are <laughs> if you're in the East Midlands, and you know, seemingly the, the the East Midlands has not had much of a COVID issue. Probably because no one's ever left and no one ever goes there. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of in this kind of permanent no quarantine. Yeah. Either way, yeah. Except people going to Skegness, but that's people within the county anyway. So, yeah, it's a weird netherworld. It just, it's well, it's just middle of everything. Yeah, I f- I'm from I'm from I guess the West Midland. Really. Oh, okay. And um, so yeah, which is li- pretty at least. It is very pretty. <laughs> it's very, it, but it's like it is sparsely um, populated. Mm. And it is sort of one of those places people go, uh, yeah. like, where's that? Yeah. So, yeah, the Midlands is this sort of, yeah, a bit of a... And you, and you, and you have to make an effort to do anything, which I think is really, you know, like even when I was a, an older teenager, I had to cycle seven miles to go to the pub of an evening kind of thing. And that's... And when I actually, when I moved to London, I would, and you know, and I had Londoner friends who would like, you know, oh, what, I'm going more than three stops in the tube? You've got to be joking. <laughs> got to be joking, mate. And that... that sense of making an effort to do anything was kind of a, you know they didn't need to because everything was on the doorstep and I think it's it's in a way quite uh, a good thing that you're kind of from an early age used to kind of making an effort and it makes things more worthwhile when you kind of achieve them almost um, definitely yeah I would totally agree with that mm. um, yeah absolutely cool so you um, you played the guitar then yes um, did you that when did you sort of start experimenting with other sounds or making other sounds or? Uh, when I got a oh, as soon as I well it was all a friend bought an early synthesizer actually bought a Moog Rogue back in that time as well and uh, which we spent many hours making farty noises with and then got a bit bored mm-hmm. but I got a, uh, a Melos uh, Bucket uh, Brigade Delay which I absolutely loved, and you, you know, you could crank it up, get it in overdrive drive mode, and then start playing around with the delay times and stuff like that. So I spent a lot of time making dreadful noises with that as well, mm. and that was yeah part of the journey, I think. Yeah, I think that I exa- I think that's the same thing. I, I mean, I've spent hours and possibly years making terrible sounding noises, mm. but yeah, that is where it leads you to being in later life, being able to like hone in on the good stuff and. Sort of avoid, <laughs> I'm avoid not even sure, entirely <laughs> sure about that. But uh, so, but just worse, well, just to continue <laughs> continue the same mucking about. I mean, essentially, you know, it's I've managed to carve out a career which allows me to muck about most of the time. I say career, that's entirely the wrong word. But I've managed to continue mucking about for most of my life, and which I think, you know, I'm very grateful for. <laughs> Definitely. I think having that childlike sense of adventure and keeping that is really, uh, yeah, it's really precious and really important because a lot of people try and grow up too quickly and, um, yeah, they maybe lose their sense of imagination. And uh, Well, yes, which, well, thank God they do because it makes space for, <laughs> it makes space for other people to, to abuse the, that hole that's left. <laughs> Definitely. How did sound dust come about and how did, uh, how did that? Like most things, it was semi-accidentally... Um, I, so, yeah, oh, I mean, I can give you a quick potted history. I, so I, uh, did a film degree, because that seemed like a really cool thing to do if you're from the East Midlands, so I ended up moving to Reading, did a film degree there, which, to- um, well, kind of doing band stuff as well, or trying to, and I ended up doing loads of kind of soundtracks and stuff for plays and, and short films then, usually, you know, with things like a, a delay pedal only and you know so it was necessity being the mother of invention um made me realize that i absolutely didn't want to make films because there was just too many people involved I, I i i like collaborativeness but i kind of quite like doing things on my own as well and film yeah and uh as a result so yes finished there went to london did more band stuff kind of did a quite a lot of gigging around london while doing kind of crap jobs, trying to get proper jobs in the film industry, did a lot of 
because of my connections from college, did a lot of kind of uh, running and first day Ding and various kind of industry stuff. Realised I really hated the film industry on all levels. What films? Uh, what I mean, what films like got you into that? Like, what sort of things inspired you? Well, studying you? film. Yeah. Uh, I was always into. I was always a pretentious little shit. Um, to be honest, and that was also massively thanks to things like uh, The Enemy and The Melody Maker at that time. They had kind of really great writers like Paul Morley and and, what, and, and Julie Birchill to a certain extent. It was very much about kind of uh, looking at things from a, from a potentially pretentious, but from a kind of an artistic viewpoint kind of a thing, rather than just the kind of, you know, glum every day, whatever you call it but it's, you know it's always about trying to find magic in things really hmm. and uh so i kind of got into film a lot thank also that i remember there was a a uh, season of john luke goddard movies which i made my parents sit through which is quite often quite embarrassing um because that was the time when you had one telly in the living room and if you wanted to watch something then everyone had to watch it mm-hmm. uh Gone of those days. Gone of those days, <laughs> in good and bad ways. Um, but absolutely, totally, John Luke Goddard movies are awful and fantastic on equal measure. So I mean, it's funny, I actually watched Alphaville again the other day and it's kind of terrible, but it's kind of brilliant. And, and that's what I, I love, that tension of, of like, well, it's doing stuff in an interesting way or in a deliberately obscure and annoying way but that in itself is a kind of brilliant act of rebellion which is what you know Jean-Luc Godard is all about kind of thing although yeah, I actually watched Weekend as well recently which which holds up really well um, but it's just that thing of kind of pushing it a little bit further than normal people would and I really like that and you know even though often you fall asleep halfway through a Jean-Luc Godard film <laughs> you are so inspired by it nevertheless just by the kind of ideas that are floating around and the kind of you know the joy of of just doing stuff because you can and why not mm. kind of thing so great yeah what about do, do, do you watch any andre tartakovsky films mm. i'm a bit i'm a bit behind on some of that so you know i've done uh, st- i did stalker didn't he yeah. and um and the other one solaris that's solaris that's yeah, yeah yeah but um yeah, so that's the, there was a bit of that. I mean, that's the thing. You were relying on BBC Two, to whatever seasons were on. You kind of grabbed what you could. You know, in the East Midlands, there was not a lot of art cinema, and I was only about fourteen at the time, anyway. So you know, it was a bit tricky. Mm. But and did the sound drive you in those to, to go yeah. into the film stuff? Well, I mean, in, interesting. Like someone like Jean-Luc Godard. I don't know. I keep going on about him. It's just one of many. Um, he's he although did do a film called British Sounds, which is about sound ish but he it was more visual than oral in those days i think but when i got to film school and you know you're literally watching two or three films a day and writing essays on them and blah de blah de blah and that was just brilliant and massively eye-opening and i you know i met like-minded people and it was uh, one of those absolutely life-changing experiences which is you know exactly what i wanted it to be kind Definitely. of thing absolutely useless to get a job afterwards <laughs> I had an interview to work at Brookside, and I think that was about the only thing I ever got out of it. Wow, the, the, the lift puddly. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and I went up and sat in one of the rooms in Brookside and was interviewed and then didn't get the job. Wow. They had quite a good synthy theme tune, didn't they, on In terms of 80s. Yes, it was, big, very, it was very 80s. 80s. It was very 80s. Yeah. Um, oh, that's brilliant. But, you know, I ended up being a cinema projectionist, um, kind of part-time, which was hilarious. And, and I was a preview projectionist in uh, Soho House. So I was actually showing three or four f- unseen films a day with two projectors doing changeovers with reels of film and all this kind of stuff. And I used to show, kind of do screenings for Barry Norman and stuff like that, who would then go and do reviews on the telly about, about you know, films he'd, I'd shown him. Amazing. And because it, it was a private members club, so, you know, I remember I know, Nick Cave, crying his eyes out at some very obscure Russian film about carrying your dead mum around for two hours and all that kind of stuff. So that was quite funny. But, um, but although the problem with that was that no one else really saw the films. That, so I was seeing loads of films, but no one else, because they hadn't been released yet, you couldn't really talk about them. <laughs> many people other, than, <laughs> yeah. other than Barry Norman and, and Nick Cave, who wasn't very chatty about the whole process. Yeah, that is an interesting sort of 
brilliant and slightly <laughs> frustrating situation. Yes. I, I, yeah, for me, it's a bit like going to the cinema by yourself, not and not having like someone there with you to go. Oh, did yeah. you see that bit with the? But at the same time, it's, it's often annoying when someone's with it. you because they're kind of poking you. Going, what about that? But yeah, no, I mean that's you know, lockdown. I really miss sneaking off to the cinema. I love going off in an afternoon and seeing something in which Brighton is great for. It's got yeah. you know two two and a half kind of art house screening rooms kind of thing and it's brilliant for that absolutely fantastic mm. well uh, Lewis Depot as well yeah which is see a couple of independent yeah. films there and there's like me and my friend yeah. in there and no one else and it's got it's got the third best sound system in the country apparently is it really yeah. Yeah. was it function one because <laughs> so, it's got the whole Dolby Atmos thing going on I think or one of the anyway because right. it's because it's co- co-sponsored by the BFI yeah but yeah I think I saw my last movie at the Depot before it all happened Oh, was I going through my life story? Go on. Potted history. Oh, yes. To, to lead um, up to Bands. The... So, yeah, I did... Oh, before that, actually. Yeah, so I was in... I moved to London in bands. Joined a band who got quite successful. We kind of were signed to Rough Trade and uh, end had a bit, had a bidding war, signed to BMG, spent a fortune. Did a first album for barely anything and got great press. Spent a fortune on the second album, which got terrible press, or not very good press. Um... So did the kind of whole band thing for a while, for a good few years, trying to, you know, touring, recording. Mm-hmm. We were recording in Rockfield just as, in Wales, just as the Stone Roses were finishing off their second album and we got the first ever play in the studio. We got it played to us. Wow, nice. It's terrible, though. Terrible album. Their second album. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's just, there's just that one track, isn't there? Um, the... the, the there's this one that sort of carried over from their second album, which everyone just about was managing to hang on to. Yeah, but then it was just this awful kind of rock odyssey. Yeah. It's dreadful. Yeah. But that's, so what was the name of the band, if you don't mind? Sharing? We were called, I've always only ever been in bands with terrible names. Uh, we Good were role. called Butterfly Child, and we uh, were kind of, you know, the kind of shoegaze kind of scene kind of thing. And, but, you know, did, got amazing press. Everything we ever did was single in the week of, of, of all the major rock press but not many people bought a record which mm-hmm. didn't help so yeah did a few years of that and then it kind of fizzled out for various reasons uh then that's when i started doing kind of tv well tv film music stuff through i got involved in um I got involved with a uh, group of artist stroke architects called FAT, who were this kind of thing in London at the time. It was a kind of uh, joint kind of coll- um, collaborative movement. And we did amazing, really large scale kind of art projects um, around London uh, and the Festival Hall and various things. Inc- like the, we did a project for the Laurie Anderson Meltdown, which was a while ago. Uh, called 0800 which involved this this is the days of phone boxes and uh uh prostitutes and he used to get cards in phone boxes so Mm -hmm. call this number for a good time and we actually was my idea we for this project for the south bank we basically just printed up loads of 0800 which was free phone numbers cards and encouraged people to phone those but it wasn't for prostitutes it was for you know what do you think of the sky or all this kind of stuff and then we had this um, managed to install a, a garden shed right in the middle of the foyer of the royal festival hall which we kind of relayed the messages that had been kind of phoned in from which was you know brilliantly stupid project nice and, and uh which was great uh did a thing with bus stops where we had 10 central london bus stops kind of each given to an artist who kind of turned them into something completely different. Um, that was for another kind of festival thing. We did, I did one which I kind of reversed the sound of the bus stop. It was a stealth bus stop, so it was, we completely mirrored it. So it was like a kind of one of those stealth um, planes. And I reversed the sound. So I kind of had it mic'd up in a way so that when a bus was coming from one way, it had kind of hidden speakers that made the sound, bus sound like it was coming from the opposite direction. Oh, nice. And it also had this kind of soundtrack kind of burbling away in the background, which was, uh, that was a really good project, actually. And, you know, 
uh, Square Pusher did a, did a bus stop as well, and and uh, really, wow, can't remember quite a few other people have kind of done quite well since then. I can't remember who any of them are though. Sadly, it was quite a while ago. Hmm. You do often get that, don't you, with the reflection of sound? Sometimes is there's some some object in exactly. one location you can totally well not exactly know in Brighton because you're always catching coming. the waves coming from the wrong directions because they're reflecting off a building. And yeah, that's I was kind of working with kind of phase cancellation and just miking things up. It kind of worked better in principle than in than in fact in the bus mm-hmm. stop, but it was a really nice effect. Have you ever? I mean, the Doppler effect's quite quite a yeah. nice effect, isn't it? Um, did you ever go to Fort Process? Yes, I was. It? Yes, yeah, I was oh, okay. the, the less worn a couple of years ago. Yes, actually, I put I put some proposals in for that, but never got selected annoyingly oh, I was gonna, I was doing yeah actually it wasn't a Doppler thing it was just I just wanted to have a thing pinging backwards and forwards across one of their huge corridors kind of thing but maybe it just wasn't very interesting yeah I, I guess they were pretty booked up but the, yeah, yeah there was like a miniature Doppler effect thing which was like um, a thing that was um, propelled by the wind and it, or each of these little capsules had were just emitting like a, a single sine wave tone. Oh, so it was. But they were spinning around like that, so, so it's they forever going away from you. Yeah, kind of sort of. But if you ran round with it, it, it would was, be a, okay. it would be a single tone. Oh, but right. if you just stood there, it would like ew 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 ew. Yeah, nice. And it's the thing, you know, simple and nice. Super simple. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 like when you walk up there, you don't know what it's going to do. You don't imagine it's anything to do with the Doppler effect. You just get closer and go. Oh look! All the it's it's it, it seems to be emitting sounds that are pitching down, and then if you run around with it, you're like, oh, that's amazing! That's really cool! Yeah. It's super simple. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it might be nice for like a, a, a an instrument, wouldn't it? Like a tom. Sort of, I wonder if you could do. <laughs> well, a I, you know, effect. obviously, I do walk around my whole life going, oh, "Is that an interest? Can I make something out of that?" And you know, if I actually dreamt an instrument last night, I've just realised, oh, which that. seemed like a brilliant idea in my dream, and I'm processing it a little bit it's not quite as good as it thought in my as i thought in my dream but um yes no i am i am constantly looking at things that can be turned into other things that could be then another thing and usually you know they do end up being an entirely different thing to the thing i started off that the thing was in the first place that was the thing mm. Mm. You should get my drift. Yeah, sort of thing. <laughs> thing it's process. It's all process. Evolution. Yes. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, because I think I mean you, a lot of your things are um, sort of hybrid or, or like impossible instruments, aren't they? Um, well, yeah. I mean, that's the, the joy of the digital age, isn't it? Is that you can make something kind of out of yeah. You can make it well. And back to your original question: How did sound dust start? It actually started when I co-bought a dulcet tone with uh, uh, a composer friend, and it was kind of fucked, really. So, um, so I thought, oh, okay, I'll sample it, and then we can at least use it. And then sampled it and thought, oh, we've got an instrument here, and and thought, oh. and this was quite a long time ago, before you know, before there really was much of a sample industry. And I originally put it on eBay, and. Um, just sold it on eBay a bit, and then it kind of, it kind of took off on as a couple of forums. Kind of, we're like, oh, this is quite interesting, and then it kind of, you know, bloomed very, very slowly from there. You know, I wasn't called Sound Dust for a good few years, mm-hmm. and um, and I would, you know, do one or two instruments a year. It was just like, oh, it's a bit of fun, um, which is, you know, still is a bit of fun, hopefully. And it kind of slowly developed from there and you know had I tried that now when the the market's so massively saturated uh, you know I would have disappeared without a trace I think but you know a uh, a dulcetone is one of those brilliant instruments that sounds great and everyone goes that's really nice Hmm. so you know I was very lucky in that respect um, to get a broken dulcetone (laughs) definitely and even being broken I think the beauty of using samples is if it is if it doesn't, if it isn't pitched right, you can you can pitch yeah, it and you totally. can make it stable. You yeah. can stabilize it. I think there's one of your instruments. I was watching the video for the rubber bass, uh-huh. and you said actually when you play this instrument, it's not in tune yeah. at all. But like the beauty of what you do now yeah, is you, that you're yeah, able you, to. Yeah, you can make it kind of more playable than the actual real thing is playable, and you know, and you can make things playable that can never be playable, like the kind of cloud instruments where you're kind of bowing uh, violas and cellos with impossible bows mm. kind of thing is is you know yeah that's the principle of that yes you can't do the kind of expression stuff that a real violinist or whatever can do but you can you can make a sound that they could never make and make it kind of playable in a way that it can never be playable 
And Definitely. That's, yeah. You know, yeah, that's that's what kind of interests me as well. Uh, yeah, and for example, there's another one. Uh, you can play two notes on the same string on your instruments. Yes. Which is very difficult <laughs> to do on a guitar, which is really cool when you think about it. Yeah, like, yeah that's a very good point, actually. Yeah. I think, no, you mentioned that in one of your videos. Did I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> God, you've done well. If you have watched some of my rambling videos. Yeah, yeah, I'm into that stuff. I'm into it. Um, yeah, so I, I released Junkyard Percussion, which oh, okay. was. Um, my nan and granddad's my granddad's tool shed and his farm recorded on that in about 2013 which started my career in the sample industry and then working in the music industry doing all kinds of things wow. but just from being in my granddad's uh, f- exactly. farm exactly yeah um, it's, it's it's the kind of it's those happy accidents that kind of somehow take off isn't it yeah but you're right it's a quite a very saturated industry but it is now. Um, i think what you've you've sort of carved out a you haven't carved out a niche because you started off doing what you wanted to do. It wasn't like a marketing well, it's, decision. It's not a niche because no one. You know, I, I, yeah, I mean, I've got a, a really, I've got a really healthy and very, uh, what's the word, just nice user base, and you know, I don't do all the advertising stuff, and I, I'm rubbish at social. Excuse me, I'm rubbish at social media just kind of irritates me really and you know I kind of lurk a bit but I've got no desire to kind of give my opinions about absolutely anything and you know I don't think anyone really is very interested either no I've recently quit uh very social media Twitter after reading a book um called 10 reasons to delete your social media account now by a guy called Jared Lanier who is behind virtual reality the development of virtual reality a long time ago and halfway through reading that book I deleted my Twitter account deactivated it because of all the stuff that's going on behind the surface yeah and my own addiction my my own growing addiction to it and reliance upon it um and everyone yeah so um yeah good move i just wanted to say to you that um in russia they have this phrase uh which they do say which is impossible is possible uh-huh. and i thought that that would really suit the sort of your instruments and like what you're doing is like yeah. the impossible is now possible but that's yeah and no, but that's the digital digital age as a whole i suppose and it's just a case of which direction you want to take those possibilities I guess and there's also that the the Japanese wabi sabi thing as well, which is kind of to do with kind of broken beauty kind of thing. Which I'm, you know, I may have got it slightly wrong there, but in my head it's about broken beauty. Right. Oh, and cool. That's a thing as well, which I quite like. Absolutely idea. imperfect. I mean, I've yeah. written down here artifacts and imperfection and unpredictability. So sort of those are things that just came into my head while looking through your. Experience. That could just be that because I'm really crap at doing it. <laughs> <laughs> there is that angle. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I just, uh, I just think if there's loads of proper stuff, and what the world needs is more improper stuff, and that's yeah, that would be my niche, I suppose. And you know, what well, there's no point in me doing a perfect piano because there's a million perfect pianos out there. But you know, there's not. You know, I think I've done the only ships piano, and I've done the only, you know, I've done things. Sponge with, piano. Yes, but yeah, with pianos that people may or may not have done, but I feel like I was, <laughs> I've done them better or first or something. Definitely, no, they're brilliant instruments. I think they're full of character, and yeah. and they do stand out in there. Yeah, um, and yeah, and that's yeah, it's, they're not kind of you're not going to use them every day, or maybe well I do, but um, you're not. Yes, they're they're kind of speciality in a way, but you know, you need that. Yeah. Can you describe how you how you made either one of those the the sponge piano pack or um... sponge piano was oh, it's kind of went through various evolutions of tr- you know it was trying to do piano harmonics and stuff like that and then getting kind of frustrated because you couldn't really do it or you could but it was so complicated to try and get things in the right place you know because bear in mind I tend to do everything myself. Um, because then I can just put the full level of kind of farting around rather than kind of having to kind of be do it properly. And, um, you know, my my techniques are very, uh, my techniques, <laughs> you know, I make it up as I go along, essentially. And I can spend weeks doing a thing and then think this is awful and give up. And I, I had a big project to do with uh, guitars strung with the same string. So, you know, you've got five six sorry six kind of high e strings all on the same guitar and in, in my head i'm thinking that's going to sound great and then you do it and it's like oh, it just sounds a bit crap actually. <laughs> it's very disappointing um 
but it's things funny like that, isn't it? Those those yeah. ideas that you like lying in bed going, that is going to be amazing, yeah. and vice versa, like that's going to not work. Yeah, but I'll try exactly. it anyway. Yeah, exactly, and that yeah, and that's the happy accident, and and you know with with the piano thing, and I was like you know muting muting pianos, and then it's like you know you, you mo- moving your thumb with a bit of sponge down a piano string as you're playing you kind of get these kind of harmonic things going on as well and you get this kind of nice clunky thud and it was like you know so I'd spent weeks doing that and then you kind of piece it all together hoping it's going to be all right and fortunately it was quite good but um yeah I mean that's the thing you you can kind of try do a quick trial version of a thing and of, of a few notes but it's not until you've got a lot of notes in that you can really see if it is going to live up to your kind of expectation of glory that you want it to be. And, um, yeah, sometimes it doesn't, but then, you know, sometimes they mute it, mutate into something else. Cause you know, it's, I've got lots of stuff sitting around on hard drives that has been abandoned at some point, but then, you know, later on I might go, Oh, that thing I did there. What if I do this to it? Uh, and that, what have you. I think you're very thorough in that you you a lot of your instruments have layers of sort of mm. different tonal qualities of a particular instrument. So you've got your main piano sound, for example. You have your ghost convolution yeah. elements in sort of light and dark. But then also like the clunk, there was one where you had like a clunk yeah. setting, yeah. which was like another layer to put on top of it, which, yeah, I mean, well, piano library is normally it's just a piano. Yeah, and yeah, and there's loads of those, so, you know, no need for more of those. But yeah, just, just being able to kind of build up a sound, you know, and with door automation, you can kind of add things and take them away in, you know, as a, a sound is progressing as well. But yeah, I mean, I yeah, I like to have kind of almost additively kind of build up sounds based on kind of organic sounds which then become kind of synthesized I suppose in a way but still clearly have that kind of chaos and kind of movement that that you know organic generally has rather than something an oscillator is produced mm. I suppose or yeah or you put an oscillator through something completely organic uh, you know and I, and so I do a lot of stuff with binaural um, recording which gives things a kind of different kind of sense of realism. So if you you know if you take something entirely synthetic and then make it organic by re-recording it in a, in a real space, um, I've got this plan, which is never may never come to the light of day. But to use oh God, now would be the time to do it. Or maybe I'll keep quiet. But it involves cinemas and Dolby surround and re-recording things. Mm. <laughs> nice. Because having worked in cinemas, I kind of know how how possible it is to do certain things, and uh, so yes, I, I quite. Oh, I forgot about that idea. I just remember uh, my ha- home in my kitchen. I couldn't do it here. I've got a whole wall just full of scribblings with kind of chalk of yeah, kind of you mentioned plans that. and schemes and and what have you. And uh, in the new yeah in the new studio, I've got a special wall kind of that's been made for me to well, it's not the wall's not been made for me, but it's been painted specifically so that I can just write crap all over it and and write things down, forget about them, and kind of notice them again, you know, six months later and go, oh yeah, that. Yeah, I do the same thing with Max for Live instruments, right. and this oh. is like one of my many notebooks, <laughs> and I occasionally just turn for a page and go, oh my god, I forgot about yeah, that, I think that's, that's a thing. great idea, when am I going to do that, I've got to remember to do that. Well, I mean, I, yeah, maybe, like, I hate lists, I really hate, my, I just, I think if an idea is any good, it will stay with you, I say that. I also write it on a wall somewhere. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm with you on that, I, I think I used to try and, um, like I work freelance, and I used to try and yeah, like list all the things I needed to do. And I was talking to a friend about this the other day. He has an Excel spreadsheet of Ooh. all his projects. He wants to use. And it's it becomes quite oppressive because yeah. you add something again to the list and you go, there's 170 projects yeah. I haven't fucking done yet. Yeah. And how long, I know that's going to take ages. That's gonna, So like, yeah, I, I'm now coming around to the, a very similar viewpoint, which is whatever is in my head that I want to do next is like the one that happens. Mm. And then I know the other ones are written down somewhere. Um, yeah, exactly. Sort of um, naturally occurring. That's great. Um, just, just um, out of interest, what was the first sampler? What was like the first time you ever had access to a sampler? I my first, 
I could never, I was mainly kind of into guitars in the 90s when samplers were coming out and I couldn't afford, you know, I couldn't afford an Akai S900 or what have you. Um, but I did get a Casio SK5. Nice. Which I literally didn't, I got a, I was supposed to go, um, it's terrible, I did a terrible thing to a friend who <laughs> we'd spend all, spent all year planning on going into railing one summer which, you know, was a month travelling around Europe or whatever. And about the week before we were due to go, I'm like, I had all this money saved up and there was a there was a sale on at Soho Soundhouse or whatever and it was like I, I got a four-track for that money. And I'm like, I'm really sorry, I bought a four-track, I can't come with you. And he was like, he was New Zealand, fuck you, Pindle. I'm going on my own then. <laughs> he's now, wait, well, he's now the bloody chief curator at the uh, Sydney... Uh, gallery, so he's done all that. Oh, he's done okay. I, yeah. I feel I've helped him out. You've, yeah, you help as a springboard. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but um, so yeah, so I got I bought a four track recorder instead and just never didn't leave the house for bloody ages. And then same with it, I got an SK five and was like, wow, I can record stuff and play it back. As and and I was just and I totally and it had the speaker, so you could play itself and then record it at the same time out of its own speaker. And I was just like, wow, I can do this. This is amazing. And I was doing loads of that stuff and recording onto my four track and. You know, just making hay with that. And I've recently, I got the four track, I've got this massive box of cassettes, four track stuff that I did, which oh, I nice. got out recently. I was trying to work my way through, and it's like <laughs> so much terrible shite. Some of it I'm listening back and wow, that's genius. And some of it is just like, Gee, what were you thinking? Yeah, I mean, yeah, surely, I mean, you can play them play them really yeah, low pitch and yeah, you might you get all that. Yeah, no, that's, like, yeah, and that's weird that, artifacts. That's, yeah, that's the plan is to. Playing is to backwards. One day, one day when I've got, the, it's just you know, it's quite, it's, it was like going through like old letters or something like you know you start off with a plan and then by the end of it you just sit in there reading stuff again and then you just forget the reason you're doing it and that's kind of what was happening so it was really hard to, you know it would take weeks to kind of go through it all and I just don't have the attention span to do that. Similarly, I've got gazillions of, um, I went. When I first got the uh, the OKM binaural mics, which are the ones that go in your ears, mm -hmm. and you can just walk around recording everything binaurally, and no one knows. Everyone just thinks you listen to headphones. And I spent, you know, I've got an archive of about ten years of obsessively kind of walk. I sound quite obsessive, not really, mm -hmm. uh, of obsessively walking around with a mini desk with my OKMs in, just recording everything. And I wish I have turned into a. Um, I've got a kind of found sound drum machine, which I made with some of that archive oh cool and there was but there was this weird thing where i then end, ended up having a kid having <laughs> giving birth to my not me personally mm -hmm. having a child and couldn't record him it was this weird thing where it felt wrong because you, know, you know he's making it he used to make these excellent dinosaur noises <laughs> like baby really, dinosaur noises really top spec yeah no, it would have been great and I just, I just had this like I don't want to record him because it's kind of chancing fate almost. It was just this weird, like if, you know, if I record him and that might mean that he won't be there, kind of a thing. Because and so I just, you know, I kind of stopped recording at that stage, which was, hmm. which was interesting and probably just as well because I, I think I'd moved on to an iRiver then, which was a kind of a hard disk recorder as well, and that wasn't quite as, somehow. And mini discs do found sound really good, and I recently bought a big like old high-end um, mini disc kind of rack playback thing and I've started kind of getting some of that stuff back again as well and it's got this really good jog shuttle so you can just do this brilliant kind of stuttery kind of slow and reverse and backwards and forwards That's thing really with mini disc really. which is really nice uh, yeah I love mini disc where you could like write track names and things like that <laughs> I, I, never, I never did that ever ever <laughs> I did so I'm feeling going no I've just got T <laughs> yeah god jeez no okay see yeah, I can't do that um, but yeah interesting enough like my last week of uh, GCSE uh, school my last year of school when I was 15 or 16 I had a mini disc player microphone lead running through my sleeve microphone coming out of my hand and I just recorded the last week of school uh, wow of, and um, it was amazing and the last day as well so I got two mini discs one of the last week one of the last wow. day and I put my hand up in loads of the classes and asked stupid questions to the teachers and recorded so it. they bollocked me and some of them some come over and like go Chris what are you doing like it's really easy God. so I've got these it's You've got a concept time waiting to, waiting to happen there it is amazing it's <laughs> like if I shut my eyes and listen to playtime it's like an amazing experience it's like wow you're really back there there's like this weird sort of parity thing happening 
Um, so yeah, mini disc is great, really yeah. versatile. And it sounds really. quite good, mini disc, bizarrely. Yeah. Similarly, Dats as well. I've got a load of Dats somewhere, and I remember every time I've played a Dat, you kind of think, "Oh, that sounds quite nice." There's something about it that does sound nice. Whereas yeah. I've never thought yeah. that, particularly with hard disc recordings, you just it's just a recording. Yeah. But there is something about. I also was one of the few people that bought a uh, DCC digital compact cassette. I had mm. one of those as well for a while, which was. So it was, it was like a, it was made by Pioneer, no, someone anyway, and it was like a, it was a cheaper version of that thing, and it was basically a cassette that played, that was digital, mm. and it was kind of terrible, terrible medium, and failed horribly. Absolutely medium. And I was the only one that had version one of the players. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, um... Um, amazing all those things. I, I often wonder like it wouldn't it be great if it was a sort of company that digitised cassettes but they had a machine that would just go like zip yeah. with the whole cassette and just do it and then um, but but then also I think it is nice to sit back and record it yourself and listen to it and just yeah just take a moment to enjoy it I think yeah but it's Depending just it's just it just fucks with your mind too much because it is you know it's going through a kind of history as well because it is it has uh, well, it has, well I mean, all recordings obviously have some kind of history but it has a particular bygone age to it as well which you know I, it's it's weirdly painful <laughs> rather than joyful but maybe i'm just reading too much into it yeah i think you can't help the way you feel like it's really interesting that you couldn't record your son i think that is um you know that's like some paternal instinct well yeah no and it kind of it, it, totally weird, it totally weirded me out as well you know and i absolutely it was you know i thought i was quite brutish and unthinking but it was like you know something made me not be able to do it and it was quite quite an interesting thing to kind of work through mm, but yeah. I'll say just as well because they would just have s such a huge archive and I'd be you know sending out sound here's my kid making a noise and well shut up boy <laughs> I guess let's talk about um, recording techniques, if you wouldn't mind. Like, how do you record your things? Um, recording, well, I, as I've mentioned earlier, I, I'm a big fan of binaural. Um, I've also been doing Blundheim technique with the Blundheim disc. No, it's not, I've packed it away. Uh, which is a kind of, because binaural has, which is essentially recording, through, I've got several kind of artificial heads and with microphones and stuff like that. I don't have the Neumann one, which costs an absolute fortune. Um, I've done a slightly cheaper version of that, but it's it's uh, so it records in the way that you, exactly in the way that your ears hear, and then when you hear it back on headphones, it's astonishing. You know, I've done I've done quite a few kind of art. I I work with an artist as well, doing kind of quite big scale sound. Uh, While well, she does these film installations uh, with surround sound stuff like that, and I've done a lot of binaural with that. But you can really, you know, you can make things sound like they're behind you and all that kind of stuff through a, through headphones. And it works quite well on stereo. But the Blundheim technique, I think it's Blundheim, um, works better in stereo and still sounds good on headphones as well. But it just gives this kind of naturalism, this kind of weird realism rather than kind of, you know, you get a sense of the whole space and sound within that space quite strongly as opposed to, you know, close miking or, what, you know, various things where you're trying to hide the fact that you're miking or that there is something listening to something mm. which I find interesting you know I, I've got no techniques to, to pass on because I just you know work through what will work and spend time making something sound as good as I think it can sound and uh, so yeah I, I, I <laughs> sorry I'm not a person to pass on techniques and stuff like that because I just you know like everyone else I, I don't I don't have a set way of doing anything um, because you know different things require different processes or what have you. Absolutely, so, yeah. But, so um, yeah, I'm not being arsy. I just, mm. I yeah. I mean, miking things up for me is, I guess, maybe like for you in the early days, which is just sticking a mic in a few different places and seeing which mm. one works for that particular thing. Um, yeah, I guess maybe like, how would you? I say so. 
Does binaural work? Because our ears have sort of different frequency responses. Yeah. Well, this is the things that are above. Yeah, and this is this is how the spatialness kind of works. And and with a with a binaural head, you actually have fake ears as well, and the microphones go within the ears. So it's the ears that do the kind of uh, the the kind of uh, filtering and what have you, and 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 make the spatialness. And it so it kind of it mimics that kind of process, which is kind of uh, yeah. I mean yeah, it's really kind of sounds. I want you know once you once you fiddled around with it and tried it and then listened back to it it's quite it's quite amazing actually yeah. or it can be cool yeah i'd love to try it i've mm. never i've only ever recorded with sort of that sort of thing um what would you recommend to to well you can, uh, you can get basically you can get a set of okm mics for about 200 quid now they're a bit the problem is the problem with any they're small can uh capacity they're small capsules which are inherently have to be noisy because it's just physics. So they're a little bit noisier than than uh, a standard kind of condenser, um, you know, mm. um, diaphragm or whatever. But they're great because you just put them in your ears and your head becomes the recording thing, and no one knows you've got them. And you know, I've also got heads that you can put them in, so you can put them on stand and you know, it's all sort of steady. But the the Blenheim thing, which is basically a a, a disc which separates and then you can put your own mics in so I've got a pair of, uh, of Rhodes kind of Omnis on either side so you can use kind of really high quality mics so you don't get slight noise issues with the OKMs but yeah for starters OKMs are great and great. you can plug them into your, into your Zoom and walk around doing kind of guerrilla recording wherever you want that's true yeah and I do think is that what people are using for ASMR and yeah things like I've, that? I've, uh, there's also that there's some American ones which is some ears on a on a stand that you uh, you can use as well. But yeah, I, I think yeah, I think people are using that kind of stuff. Although I think they're also just using a pair a stereo pair of mics and whispering into them, so they're not even that binaural. I was going to do an ASMR channel, <laughs> quite literally of, of just holding up bits of um, silly gadgets and tapping them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, and I just never got around to doing it. But you know, in the studio, I've got access to such amazing gear. So you know, just to hold on, hold on a Roland eight hundred eight up and twiddle with the knobs in front of her. I thought it would be very exciting. I think Heinbach. <laughs> do you know who Heinbach is? Has he done I think that? he did. He yeah. did one uh, like a recording of him going through the studio, studio and clanking every, all the oh, knobs right, okay. and like. I've, just as well, I didn't do it then. Um, but uh, maybe because someone commented in his video, "Oh, please, can you record the sounds of all this gear yeah. not making noise but um, clanking around?" Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he's got really big with all his sort of testing. Yeah, he has. And, yeah, and, yeah. Um, Soviet, Soviet sort of stuff. I just don't. I, I wonder how people afford all this stuff. <laughs> that's that's my thing. I'd love to have that big space with all those amazing things. But you know, even getting a, a an old Nagra tape machine these days is like thousands of quid. Yeah. And it's quite you know. So why have you got three of them? <laughs> Well, you're a posh boy, really. <laughs> Look more no computer as well, so you yeah, have like clearly an unbelievable yeah, amount clearly of space. A massive posh boy. <laughs> I get, I get, um, I get anxious watching some of the big YouTube, the big sort of music tech YouTubers, because I just worry about how they're ever going to move house and like yeah, how too, annoying yeah. and uh, like the operation required and like what sacrifices they must have made in other parts of their yeah. house to, well, to yeah. allow for all the Well, yeah, Richard Devine's and... room of, like, glowing lights and it's just, you know, mental modular stuff. I, I'm just thinking, who can be asked to just spend hours patching all that stuff in and out? Because, you know, I've, I've, I've got... I dabbled in modular and it's, you know, it's handy, but it's also really annoying as well and it's just so... Oh, sorry about my phone. Huh? It's so ties into the kind of male brain kind of buying hunter collector kind of thing oh you know it's about 200 quid oh i can get one of those oh yeah and then if i get that then oh, everything will be great and then oh oh no i need another one because then it will be great and you know all that stuff yeah uh, the, yeah the gear acquisition um syndrome is yeah. a big one um yeah what I'm, i mean I'm, I'm i've let go of a lot of stuff over the years a lot of gear and i have bought a lot over the years but bought and sold but yeah i'm definitely letting go and using less and less to make music with now um but the one that gets me is like when a new piece of equipment comes out and all of the big youtubers and all the channels have got that new thing and they're all just promoting it because they got it for free yeah they got paid to say it yeah like that's like the new commercialism is yeah. like just one guy. So yeah, I, I get a little, I just, I find it a bit uncomfortable when the day comes that 
you know, Moog release a new synth, and oh, lo and behold, everyone's raving about and it. And then a again. week later, they're raving about something else. Yeah, yeah. It's like, um, I think that's why I like what you do, because you're looking into either vintage, you know, traditional instruments or, f you know, odd sounds that no one's done. And um, you've got to go out and find those things, you know, you mm. explore those avenues. It's not something that comes to you, like, easily. I yes, no, it's, uh, yeah. And that's another thing I, you know, I, Scour. Actually, it's a shame. There was an excellent um, uh, uh, auction house in Lewis, which is closed down. But you know, I, I used to go there. But I've actually I bought a dulcetone from there, actually quite reasonably priced as well. But yeah, just just always looking. You know, I, I don't do car boots so much now because they're a bit rubbish. But um, although I do have a, a which you can't see because it's all gone. I've excellent collection of of bad paintings of dogs, <laughs> which I collected over the years from car boot sales. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm constantly looking out for, and you know, and I think possibly there is a point now where there isn't anything now that hasn't been done in a sampling thing, which is why you then have to kind of push it in different directions and work out ways of doing new stuff, kind of that hasn't been done. Mm. Um, I like your, um, I like your um, triple uh, arpeggio thing that's oh, in yes, one of your... Oh, in, yes, infundibulum. Yeah, the infundibulum, yeah, time funnel yes. uh, <laughs> thing. Yeah, the super arp, is it? Yes. Yeah, I love that idea. I mean, um, what's yeah? What what's the infundibulum? So that is... Uh, it started with, well, you know, everyone's got an arpeggiator, but it was like, you know, it was like, what if you have an arpeggiator that well three arpeggiators controlling different sounds that can be different lengths and all that kind of stuff and it was just kind of snowballed from there it took a long time to build and a long time to kind of work out you know what was special about it almost as well but but it also it's not just an arp it's uh, a kind of gate sequencer as well so you can have a long sound with bits cut out of it over a period of time with a, with the same sound with different stuff happening at the same time as well so it's it's a way of, of adding, well, it's chaos, but obviously very organised chaos as well, and, it, and, and kind of, you know, polyrhythmic and what have you. But it's also, there's kind of two versions of Infundibulum. One is quite uh, kind of plinky-plonky. Uh, it's quite short sounds um, from varying things, from uh, tuning forks to roads, uh, electric pianos and actual pianos and lots of those kind of you know short sounds which then all melded together across varying patterns becomes quite interesting or can become quite in it was you know it was it was a, a an approach to kind of you know minimalist composers like um, Reich and 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 what have you and then there's another version which is more kind of longer kind of gnarly kind of squash through tape and spring echoes and stuff like that sounds which is um quite nice as well actually mm. but uh yeah no the infant dibblings have been quite uh yes quite well received i would say yeah and the the modular as well got sort of going still yeah. taking a step back to the modular thing you use a vcs3 yeah overheim expander yeah is it expander dfam the dfam's nice isn't it really yeah fat. sounds really great it's a really good sound it's, that was one of those things i really didn't want to buy one and i went and played with it in gak or somewhere and it was like oh, this is really nice and I, I resisted getting the, the what was the thing they just released? Mother? No, there's a new the, the one that just came out. Oh, yeah, the, the, the Harmonium? Yeah, something like that, yeah. I totally resisted getting one. <laughs> but I was like, that's mm, quite nice, isn't it? it? That felt to me like a synth company going a bit off. Yeah, no, off I think that's good. And I think that, that range that they've been doing, which they have those kind of moog days where they kind of build... Or, you know, weeks where they kind of build stuff and release them to a few people there and then kind of turn them into products later on. I think that's a really good approach. Yeah, I've got to say, I got a work stat from someone second hand okay. in Brighton. Oh, that's he, the, yeah. he didn't know if it worked, so I got it for like seven, 70 quid or something. Right. But it's it's about it's like that big, and they, they did just make workshops so you could put yeah. your own moves together. I mean, you really just put the PCB in a case, yeah. and apparently you've made the synth. But yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing sounding synth. It's tiny, but my God, it's big i mean you know sonically right yeah and um or you've got the patch bay on the right hand side to do loads of little things yeah that was a big um yeah total surprise to me really just um 
wasn't expecting it to be really good, but it, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, so it did work then. He would say so you, t- you totally got a bargain. Yeah, I totally got a bargain. <laughs> uh, there was like wires sticking out of it, but I'm like, I'm sure that's just someone's. Um, yeah, it's just a sort of well, gut instinct one where I was like, I think that's okay. I'm gonna chance it. And it was going bright, and so it wasn't wasn't too difficult to yeah. get to. Cool. You have also done soft synth patches as well. Yeah, just I I do, I do a bit of Omni, Omnisphere stuff. Just to kind of mix it up a bit, because it's it's uh, you know, it's nice to have a break from. I mean, yeah, because I tend to do I do things. There's no plan. I kind of I get excited about a thing and I do it. And if I'm not excited about a thing, I can't do it. So I do something else. And and I kind of oscillate between, you know, I've phases where I'm obsessively making music and phases where I'm obsessively making sample instruments. And if if I was obsessive I keep saying, I'm not obsessive I'm not obsessive all right I just you know get enthusiastic about stuff and um and yeah and it's like it's nice to kind of break away from stuff and, and push you know try something else so I I tend I've done stuff for Diva and uh, and Yuhi Diva and uh Zebra as well and I tend to kind of try and break them really and see if I can kind of make them you know give up the ghost kind of thing <laughs> Z- zebra i i spent ages working with zebra and the, the problem is because it's kind of modular and what have you so i mean it's a great sounding thing but for me it's got almost too many options and it just fries my brain a little bit because you can't you can whatever you you can't push it into a corner and kind of make it kind of weep yeah it's because it does yeah, so you end up with this kind of option paralysis, which I could just go on forever, kind of making stuff and going, oh, that's not well, maybe that one's better. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, hats off to people that can keep churning out sets for stuff. I mean, you know, I don't buy other people's. <laughs> I expect people to buy mine. Definitely, yeah, definitely <laughs> that way around. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. It's sometimes nice to, because I do a bit in Max for Live. Yeah, well, with your hats off. I've got a friend who does a lot of work in Max and Jitter and stuff, and I've looked at it, and you know, my, my brain doesn't work that way. Yeah, it was lucky how I ended up doing that. But, um, yeah, sometimes you build something, and it does break a bit, mm. and you, it's, like, nice, and you want to get it to a point where people, other people can still do that with it, you yeah. know? Like, you want to... It's a bit, I suppose, a bit like circuit bending as well. It's finding yeah. a resistor that has a nice range on it, but doesn't like reset the machine when you you know do it yeah. too much. Um, yeah, I saw you got the Zoom twelve oh four there. Um, it's amazing that that's still boxed. It really is. I I, I keep all boxes, yeah. which has been handy because I've actually been doing a lot of selling recently because I I'm moving to a smaller studio and and it's like okay, you could, this all my stuff won't fit in and and because I, I tend to buy stuff for projects that's my excuse for getting stuff that I don't really need. It's like oh I could do a project with that. Mm-hmm. And so I have been selling some some stuff off, and it's weirdly liberating as well. I'm surprised how Absolutely. pleasurable it's been. Absolutely. But especially when it goes to a good home, if it goes to someone who's really yeah. appreciating yeah. it. Yeah, and they generally have been as well, which is nice. But I um, I had a DNA test a while ago, and I do have there is a gene for apparently for keeping stuff just in case you need it later on mm-hmm. and i have that gene and i at- absolutely have that gene you know I've, I've been saying this to people for years and, and they're like wait well, yeah, i might need that one day and um and i've yeah, been trying to work against my genetic I've, I've also got the gene that means i get really smelly piss when i drink uh, when i eat um that stuff oh god asparagus, asparagus yes. oh my god yeah so do i yeah that, that's, that's the gene <laughs> And I can't smell fox poo, bizarrely, which which is a gene they haven't tested for yet. Right, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. Yeah, I think I, I was saying before, I think there is a circuit benders modification yeah, which, for that, which is um I think it I think it slows down the the clock. So you're essentially controlling the clock because he's done one for the Behringer Virtualizer Pro. Right, okay. Which is a, a piece of, of shit really. Yeah. But there's there's two of them. And he does a mod, and you've you've got a switch. So you've basically got two units in one from a switch, right? Okay. And both of them are like pitch yeah. And no, I'm totally going to look into that because I mean that's you know that I bought that twenty five years ago, and it's you know hasn't been used for a very long time. And it's I think I tried to sell it and couldn't, but yeah, I might as well give that a go. Yeah, it's funny that I think that piece of gear is like the the thread that 
put so, that sticks all my podcasts together because <laughs> I, I think you're now like the fourth person. Really, I've everyone's got one. They're and trying they just to get rid of. to have one, and it's always like the lowest one in the rack or somewhere. It's that always... one of those elusive midi, elusive midi verbs as well, which yeah, you know, exactly. are totally from a certain era. Exactly. Yeah, there are some things that just actually everyone has them. Um, well, I suppose that, that that was one of the first kind of affordable digital multi verbs. Kind of thing because there, there was you know there was the the Elise's quite well the, the Elise's midi verbs which were terrible, but they only did one thing and then this kind of came along and the, and I think that was before that no, was after the quadra verb which were kind of quite expensive as well at the time, hmm. um, but yes that whole kind of wrecked, not good quality synth, um, reverbs with something else as well was definitely quite, yeah it's quite a rare thing and you know that's before plugins and all that kind of stuff so. Yeah, and I like this. It's got like a sort of quasi ring moddy thing, quasi sort of um, sample rate reduction yeah. things, which are well, also. Well, and, and the vocoder on there is quite good as well. I've actually used it on a track years the ago. What, sorry? There's a vocoder on yeah, there. Well. Yeah, that's nice. yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, mm. yeah, it's true. Yeah, there is. And so, what re- what music uh, have you worked on, <clears throat> or, what, or what music do you do you make? Uh, I do. Uh, I occasionally release stuff under the name Id Monster. Um, actually I've got a big box of albums over there actually I'll, I'll make oh, yeah. a take away in a minute because <laughs> yeah. I got I, uh, yeah anyway um, I do quite a lot of library stuff as well which I find fascinating and, and brilliant and seemingly the more library stuff I release the less PRS I get so <laughs> I'm going wrong somewhere um, I went through a phase when I did you phase cancelling your yeah, I think work. I am yeah I just, just stopped doing anything but you know I actually got put quite a lot of stuff out this year as well so next you know next PRS is going to be rubbish but um, I did go through a phase of doing quite a lot of TV stuff as well um, I had my name on the end of both relocation and location location etc for a good many years which is you know, my cool. PRS was quite nice well it's hilarious I got commissioned to do libraries for them a few times and I just made the most inappropriate music for, their, <laughs> for those shows, it, you know, because I essentially don't do jolly or happy music. I do miserable dirges, mm-hmm. and it was, you know, and I was doing like, you know, <laughs> being, you know, track titles horribly gazumped or, or you know, <laughs> haven't got enough money to cover the mortgage kind of things, and you know, so all the like it going wrong music, fine, but the jolly here's Kirsty going to a lovely place music, I don't do that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was quite funny. I did a lot of I did a lot of theme tunes for housing shows at one point as well, which was hilarious. One of which is still going strong in Australia, and even though it's been re-recorded by several other people, I still get the publishing for it because it's my tune. So that's quite nice. They even asked me a few years ago, "Oh yeah, can you can you do us a new version of your, of your theme tune?" And I kind of had a few goes, and now nah, we'll get someone else. <laughs> they, they didn't like my own version of my own theme tune. Yeah, maybe you just hit like you, you nailed it the first time. <laughs> but yeah, felt, like but seriously. It, but it was yeah, it was a kind of relief. It's like you know, just yeah, get someone else to do because I'm still getting the publishing either way. So I don't I don't care. That's great. And in and in terms of like people that have used your instruments and and used them on tracks. Oh God, I mean you know I'm forever hearing. St- I mean yeah, I mean I've got a, most. Says he modestly. Most uh, kind of known composers kind of are using stuff of mine. Um, uh, Gary Barlow apparently uses it. He's been very kind. Has Amazing. written a nice testimonial on my website. Um, yeah, I mean, just, yeah, just most people, I'm their kind of little secret weapon that they don't like to talk about, basically, mm. which is fine by me. I don't like to talk about it either. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that that's... Yeah, and it's nice to kind of, you know, my ears kind of often prick up when you're watching telly, going, oh, that's, that's one of mine, I think. Yeah, um, it's got a very cinematic quality. Well, it. I try and avoid, to be honest, I really try and avoid that whole cinematic thing. It kind of drives me mental. I know the what whole, you mean. The whole Zimmer bollocks. <laughs> Excuse me, you can take that out, maybe. <laughs> How dare he? He said Zimmer's bollocks. No! <laughs> but I just, I just hate all that. I really do. I just find it so... No, Dash, you do take this out. <laughs> no, don't. No, do. Well, I don't know. It, it's sort of like, I don't know, I think the, you, the sounds you'll make are very much... The sounds you make are very much about... Um, like, there's detail, isn't there? And there's I just clarity. don't like that bombast stuff. And that... Um, and you know, it's be, there's become this. I mean, I, you know, I, I the last composing work I did with I got chucked off a Netflix series a couple of years ago, 
and that was the first thing I'd done in ages anyway and it was a kind of relief because it is I just feel sorry for anyone who's in that kind of just drudgery of writing TV music <laughs> and what have you. it's just horrible and the amount of people you know I wouldn't be a composer I mean I've hats off you know I did that I went through that and I got spat out and I'm bitter and twisted about it now but it was it was you, you just spend your whole life waiting for kind of you know please like me you know, please like what I'm doing please give me a job and it's just awful you know that way lies absolute mental torment and you know and it is it is really bad for your mental health I think all of that that stuff because you are at the beck and call of, a, of an industry that certainly you know you're Although they say how important music is, you're very near the bottom of the food chain, and it's and you've got and it was when I was doing more stuff, it, you were generally dealing with a director, but you know, latterly you're dealing with a director and some producers and some more producers, and they're all trying to keep their jobs, so they don't dare stick their neck out and go, no, this is great, we this is what we want. It's all like, oh no, make it sound like more like Zimmer or what have you, mm -hmm. you know. And that and that's you know shows in the majority of TV music, and except for you know people like Mark Munden who's using Christopher Tapia De Vere for for stuff, you know, for Utopia and what have you, which is, you know, you've got a kind of an auteur director who's using an auteur kind of composer, and I think that works really well. But I just that stuff, you know, exact, you know, you know exactly how TV music should sound now and film music to a lot of the way as well and it usually does sound like that yeah i find it i mean i i'm not a tv watcher like i don't have a tv but i find when i do watch tv the um the music's like quite coercive like it's quite blatantly yeah. yes you it's know it's doing the job we are we yeah. are supporting the emotion yeah. of the scene yeah. with and the music yeah. and it's unashamed you know it's right there in front yeah. of you yeah and, and it's, and it's subtlety because that, there's because yeah because there's this thing about yeah directors can't say what they need to say with actors anymore they have to be utterly and, and the meantime you know these poor old composers are being absolutely run through the mill to kind of but and but you know and being treated really badly even though at the same time they've seeming this music is you know really important part of the show but yeah i, I you know that some of the uh greatest i just love seeing and anything that doesn't have music these days to be honest <laughs> Like, you know, it's, oh, thank God for that. You know, I can make my own decisions about how I feel about someone, you know, something happening. Mm. And it is, uh, I don't know, did, did you see Bait? No. Which is a fan, it's this kind of black and white 16 mil thing about a fisherman in Devon. It's absolutely the greatest film in the world. Oh, okay. And, it's, and it's, it actually does have a soundtrack, but it's really minimal and it's just awesome. You know, it's all handheld, self-processed. Self so it's like you know, it's like it's like an art house EastEnders kind of thing. It's just amazing, a really great film. And um, but you know, just really, it's not got not doesn't got all that music cliche going on and stuff. And yeah, I just I could rant for hours about how I I just feel sorry for I know I'm actually selling the tools to the, a lot of these people. God, maybe you should take this out. Um, but it is a, it's a horrible industry. I, I, I've bizarrely done quite a lot of stuff in Japan, um, music. There's a company over there I used to do quite a lot of work for. It's kind of slowed down a bit now. But they're fantastic because you kind of do some work and they say, oh, they say, thank you, and they pay you within the week. Mm -hmm. Over here, you just get treated like shit and it takes months to get paid and it's just horrible. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, I'm relieved not to have to rely on that kind of side of things anymore, actually. Yeah, I think um, I thought the hang drum as well. You know that, that sound <laughs> yes. that's so overused. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, then, yeah, no, and uh, you know, oh, don't start me on bloody Radio Two emotional piano music as well. <laughs> it's like you know, Oliver Arnold is a lovely guy and all that kind of stuff, but all that kind of piano-y kind of like tasteful kind of semi-ambient, semi-classical stuff. Pff, you know, I'm a bit sick of it all. Mm, Which you know, um, um. But then, you know, like uh, Ben Salisbury and uh, your man out of Paul, said that the stuff they've done for, for devs and that they did for uh, Ex Machina and stuff like that's really good. Actually, in Toy Drum, um, people in here, they, they've got a couple of TV things coming out soon. And, that, you know, they're doing really kind of much more less generic, kind of interesting kind of soundtrack stuff for telly, which is nice to see. But it's, I think it's really hard to do anything but the kind of stuff that's expected. And you know, and you did, it takes a very brave director or a very established director to kind of do allow allow anyone to do that. Yeah, I I guess it's a mainstream medium, and they need to 
They need to yeah cater for as many people as possible with visuals, with uh, storylines, and with, yeah. with music. So, um, but, but but it's just that the you know which is why. Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's just there's so many levels of decision making in the in the kind of TV industry that, and everyone's just scared that everyone's hanging on by their fingernails, and not wanting to lose their jobs. So, it just you know wipes out a certain level of creativity, which you know should be allowed to just kind of flourish I yeah. think, and it kind of can't well great you've done sync work I always had this image of like oh I would love to sit down and do sync work it would be an idyllic world uh, but yeah I guess yeah there are it's, it's, it's a complicated beast. It, it, well, yeah. It, it, I'm also, I think I'm probably not very, not very good at it as well. You know, I, it, it's... it's Because uh, I, I also come from the line of thought that kind of anything fits with anything. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. it kind of does. And, you know, because it's, it's that, you know, you assume that something put with something is intentional and therefore your brain makes the, the appropriate kind of, you know, synaptical connections. And... In fact, yeah, some of the best stuff is stuff stuff where the music is separately composed and then bunged onto an image, and it's like, and so it's not kind of like, oh, someone moves their arm and it goes, you know, all that of kind of Mickey Mousey stuff, and it's like when it's almost diegetical, it's part of the thing, but it's not, and it kind of comments rather than kind of backs up. I think that's that's when it's more interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or it can be more interesting. It can also be obviously terrible as well. <laughs> but like the uh, that what's his oh Adam, the guy that does those amazing kind of BBC documentaries like once every two years. Adam Curtis. Oh yeah, yeah, Adam Curtis stuff. The way he uses music is amazing, and it just works so well. And it's not composed. It's just you know he gets some. He's got a good musical, you know, whatever finding him stuff, and it goes on, and it works brilliantly. Absolutely, I I rave daily about Adam Curtis yeah. to people uh, yeah and it, I mean yeah soundtrack wise incredible like the story of um, River Deep Mountain High that's in his film It Felt Like a Kiss that's amazing Ooh, I don't know that one yeah it was a, a half hour film that we, he didn't narrate he just put subtitles over yeah. and it was with a company called Punch Drunk and it was part okay. of a big, oh, big right. installation yeah. in London that was oh. a house that you went to yeah, yeah. and on the wall was this film It Felt Like a Kiss projected and uh, yeah, so it's his ah, narration. Right. But that's brilliant. It's only half an hour. Um, but yeah, Bitter Lake and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's funny she mentioned stuff Punch maybe. Drunk because I, do you know Dream Think Speak, who done quite a few things in Brighton? I don't know. They were that. doing it before Punch Drunk, and I, I was doing the soundtracks for their stuff with you know huge, like there was a show we did, uh, taking over a whole department store, and I and actually I was working with <laughs> talking of pianos. Uh, Max Richter was the kind of main composer was before he got massively famous and I was the kind of sound designer kind of stroke composer on it as well on that particular show well actually not quite a few of the shows but you know and you've basically walked around a huge department store with crazy shit happening everywhere which is what Punch Drunk do and I had to wired up the whole department store with the old tannoy system and had various things going on in different rooms and, and kind of you know, sound installation-y stuff kind of going on yeah, I've done quite a few of those which have been you know really kind of good experiences and diffi- very difficult experiences. Yeah, a lot of soldering. soldering <laughs> in the, well, a lot the of running room. cables, because this, you know, you know, literally running it off, off a computer with Ableton Live with, with as many outs as possible and literally sending cable to a room with some speakers in it and kind of, you know, controlling it all from one thing and, and just having to actually downtime with a system like that where you can, set, you can kind of do music mixes coming from all different rooms and stuff like that. It was great, actually. That would be cool, yeah. Just send one part of a track to one room and yeah. another part of a track well, to another. Yeah, which I've, exp- I've mucks about within a department store. And it's yeah, that's like getting a, get a bit, getting a bit Brian Eno really mixing, yeah. isn't it? That's really cool. But yeah, laying the cable, not so much fun. <laughs> and packing it up packing again. Up after Even, <laughs> unfortunately, I never had to pack it up again. I just had to set it out in the first place, which is quite good. That's good. Oh, yeah, that's mm. okay. That's the fun bit, maybe. Yeah, so I really like some of the names of some of of your <laughs> things that you've called, and also like the the the, det- the the things you can do with them. You know, the parameters. They're right. all they're all sort of quite um, interesting names. Do you have any favourites of things that you've named? Naming is funny 
I've always been in bands with really shit names, so I've, I've tried really hard to actually do good names for other things, but uh, for my instruments and also the kind of presets as well to a certain extent. But um, yeah, no, because it, it, it's like I they are kind of I do treat them almost like you know like doing an album or something like that. You know, they are my babies and I absolutely love them and think they're the greatest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. until the point where I just can't be asked anymore and I'm <laughs> sick of them and they need to clear off and then I'm working on the next one. Mm. So, yeah, they're absolutely labours of love and name is, naming is quite funny. They, it's, they often go through many different name changes and then it's like when, when it kind of sticks, you're kind of like, yeah, that's, that's its name. That's, that's what it is. And similarly with the, with the GUIs, I spend so long kind of designing and building knobs and moving around one pixel and, and you know, I'm not a designer and... It's. I would like them to be a bit better looking as regards kind of. Well, I mean, it, well, as regards the quality of the knobs, but it's quite tricky with what's available, to be honest. Um, mm. Unless you kind of spend months rendering in Photoshop, and I'm not clever enough to do that. Uh, but yeah, no, the way things look and feel and the controls are really important. I, you know, I don't like. I find those ones where it's trying to look like a piece of hardware and all that kind of stuff quite annoying. I kind of dabble in that a little bit, but not, not to the extent that it's... I just don't like all that kind of silly extra shears that you don't, that you don't need just there to kind of look a bit kind of classy or whatever. I find those quite cheesy. Yeah. Maybe, maybe everyone does. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, the whole... I mean, it's all part, you know, it is all part of the package, really, how it, how you use it. I mean, there is that difficult thing where, obviously, you've spent months with the thing, you know how it works really well. So, and I'm very bad, I'm probably very bad at explaining things as well. So I expect everyone to understand as much as I do, because I do. So why doesn't anyone else? Which isn't, you know, obviously not great as a developer. Mm, I understand that problem completely. Because <laughs> you, you've worked on the engine, the yeah. bits all behind it, you've sampled it all. And it's easy to assume that everyone else was with yeah. you that whole time, exactly. but they weren't. So. And clearly they weren't. So yes, that that is that is a less good thing. But uh, yeah, no, I, I I actually yeah, I get a lot of uh, the coding is the sampling is hard work. The coding is hard work, but sometimes quite joyful. The GUIs I just quite I quite like moving pixels around and kind of making knobs and trying them out and what have you. Uh, yeah, I like to try and. Uh, have a few have jokes in things as well if I can. Uh, there's usually something kind of silly hidden somewhere. Possibly there is. Yeah. Did you have the eyes of one of the ghosts following yeah, the curse yeah, around yeah, in yeah. one of them? Yeah. <laughs> those sorts of details are nice, aren't they? I yeah. That sort I of like to have bits, of, bits of that kind of thing in there. So are you building the whole thing from yourself? I've, you? I've got a secret coder who does some of the really hard stuff um, in contact for me because I'm not a coder. I've you know I've been doing it for quite a long time now, but I'm, the stuff that is way beyond me which I, I do get a guy in to help me to do that stuff for me because mm, um, they had um, they had that contact GUI builder didn't they contact GUI maker oh yes which I think I tried and was actually more irritating than just doing it yourself <laughs> and the, and there is the new uh, for contact 6 there is the whole buildy thing but it doesn't build for contact 5 and people are still essentially contact 5 if I just if you only release something in contact 6 then you, you know you're losing a lot of kind of customers, I think. Mm. So you have to you have to work from five upwards rather than from six downwards because you can't make it go from six down. Right, and then doesn't does that? What's that? What is that piece of software that comes with Contact that allows you to finally make your yes. own instrument? Oh, oh, Creator or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but that only works for six, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So then, what you're saying is that you can't really you can't use it if you've yeah, got to go for five upwards. Yeah, I mean, it might be you know, there might be clever ways of making it backwards compatible, but. I'd rather put the time into just you know tinkering tinkering around in the way that I tinker around, and mm. uh, I should I mean I probably in a year's time when or when five has finally died then maybe that's the time to get into it more and probably I should be kind of learning it more now. Yeah, I found it very difficult. Yeah, like native instruments. Well, it's, it's also it's another language. It's Lua or something, which is like so. It's another language to learn to kind of control to do another language, and it's. Like, yeah, I mean, I've programmed a little bit of, of a couple of synth, edit synth editors in Renoise, which is a DAW, okay. like a tracking DAW, yeah. and that's in Lua, which is great. So yeah. I went to Oh, this, so you know Lua already? Uh, yeah, well, a bit to build a synth, Sizek yeah. synth editor, yeah. Um, but I tried to use this new contact 
thing to make uh, instruments with for native instruments i just found there wasn't enough uh, support like how yeah. to use it they're notorious for not yeah they're as bad as me actually <laughs> expect everyone to understand how it works I mean, yeah, but it's the it was, same with the yeah, contact really. scripting language it's you know some of it is it's is so kind of obscure kind of explanations and and you know people do kind of stumble across across things that aren't even mentioned and and what have you mm. um which in a way is kind of part of the appeal of it maybe as well because it is but i remember there was uh the first time someone years ago someone offered lessons in context scripting on some forum and people got really asked it's like don't let other people know how we do this this is our secret thing and you know it was quite funny how in forums people can just get arsy about anything yeah i i mean i've done a couple of tutorials for a friend's website about how to build synth editors in max for live and i do sell quite a lot of synth editors and i'm like yeah. Is this a stupid idea? Is this really stupid? <laughs> but what I'm showing really is the absolute basics. And um, this is what I've told myself. Uh, I've been doing it for like 20 years and there's so much more to just simply having a knob with a CC on it. Yeah. It's like there's so many more things that actually it's quite nice that I'm going to put out how to make it and uh, get people on, on, the, on the track. But yeah, it is a bit of... Um, I think contact scripting and Max for Life probably quite sort of similar beasts in that. I think Max for Life is much harder. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, I, I should totally uh, put you in touch with my friend who is who does. Uh, he's in Brighton. He he does stage visuals for like Ariana Grande and stuff, and he's oh, wow. got these amazing Max rigs that he's built, and it's all live visuals and stuff. Maybe, but you yeah. know, he'd be a good guy to do a thing on as well. Definitely. Yeah. He's a, you know, he's a musician who got into Max and then has just taken it to this whole kind of different business level and, and, and you know, and is touring the world with huge bands doing kind of Max visuals or Jitter and Max visuals. Yeah, there's a lot of nice objects that are just there ready for you. Yeah. Um, Ned Rush does a, does quite a few tutorials right. on them. He's um, he's a modular guy, I think. Right. He's, but he's doing a lot of YouTube stuff now with Max for Live and, uh, and Ableton. And um, yeah, I'd love to meet that guy, yeah. absolutely. Um, I'm now at the stage... I mean, this, this is, I'm just going to show you this for, I guess maybe I'm showing off, I don't know. Uh, I'm now at the stage where I'm drawing Max for Live devices oh in a notebook. Oh my god, uh, yeah. That's... Like, uh, in the park. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm... That's nice. Yeah, but, that's, but that's the beauty of code, in a way, when you can... I mean, I can do that a little bit. I can imagine kind of how I... I on a very basic level, how I would code something. And it's, there's, a, there's a kind of real... There is a real beauty in that, isn't there, when you kind of... Solve solve a problem in an elegant way, kind of via what you're going to do is is you know one of the charms of it, isn't it? Definitely, it's really. If I feel like it's super nerdy, like it's ridiculous how many hours I put into it, but like because I I know the objects that are available yeah. to me, the hundreds, maybe even thousands of objects yeah. that. Yeah, it's nice to not be in front of a computer and design it and go home and you know it, it fucking works. So oh, yeah, um, you should totally talk to my friends, do you? Yeah, will do. Who yeah. called his company Video Dust without asking me? <laughs> really? <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> I did tell someone I was going to uh, uh, interview Sound Dust, and they were like, "That's a great name." <laughs> my friend, um, my friend Adam, who uses a lot of tape loops. Oh, okay. He's uh, yeah, he doesn't go near a computer making music. Good for him. Has he got some Nagras? What? Oh, that, is that a tape it's machine? Expensive tape machines. No, he uh, he's cassette, I think, and oh, then okay. like uh, yeah, four track. He's he's very old school, but he's got this amazing thing which he's he won't mind me saying it because I'm not going to mention a model or I don't know what the hell it is, but it's basically an answer phone machine uh -huh. from like thirty or forty years ago. So it had a tape put in it, yeah, but it was from like a BBC building in Manchester somewhere, and he said he's carried this like. 18 kilo box <laughs> around with him everywhere he's ever been and uh, it looks like a one-off sort of piece of equipment but it's amazing Ooh. it's really really good it's got one of those like sort of looks like a midi lead power socket oh yes you know? it's just yes. like some mad oh, yeah dim switch yeah power thing thin plug those are the days yeah, cool. Um, I don't want to. I don't sort of go with any of the tropes of podcasting. And what are you up to next? Or <laughs> how do you? But yeah, if there's anything you want to sort of talk about or say, or anything you uh, that you are work that you've worked on that you're really proud of, perhaps, or something people should check out if they don't know your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> they, well, obviously, everything in it. Everything, everything all from of sound it. Dust, obviously. There are some freebies as well. Yeah, there's, yeah, website, yeah, there? there's yeah, freebies, so. yeah. Some quite nice ones, actually, which I sometimes think, yeah, I should have charged for those, because they're quite good. <laughs> uh, 
but yeah, there's there's a good good selection of freebies and, and what have you. There's actually my with my uh, artist Lindsay Sears is a show just opening in rugby actually, which if anyone's in rugby they can go and see that, which is got which is a, a sh I haven't seen this version of it, but it's um it's a kind of big sound a big film and sound piece mm -hmm. um, with surround sound and stuff I think. Oh great! So anyone in rugby should go there. Oh, uh, that's it really. Mm. I'm not. I'm not a publicist. <laughs> no, my friend Jason's like that, and I basically met him. I bought one of his pieces of equipment and said, "Let me do your marketing for you." Um, yeah, it went pretty well. <laughs> but um, it's different, isn't it? I think um, you've got to, yeah, you've got to be motivated by what. I just haven't got the energy for it, to be honest. I, you know, I'd rather muck about doing what I'm doing than kind of, you know do stuff I don't enjoy, ultimately. So, mm. I mean, that's the theme. I've done very well at doing and not doing stuff I don't enjoy, or I've, or, at, or I've at least found a way of enjoying stuff. <laughs> maybe that's what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what sounds, yeah, maybe finally, like what sounds do you really love that you hear and uh, bring you the joy, maybe the joy of that radar? That's a very that interesting not. question, actually. I, uh, I mean, the, well, I mentioned it, like the dev soundtrack, there's a few things in that that totally, I thought, wow, how have they done that? I mean, a lot of the time, yeah, I kind of walk around kind of, you know, analysing things as well, kind of going, okay, yeah, that's done by this and what that and the other. But it's it's when, when you're kind of a bit stumped on how something was made. I think that's great. I like that. Um, my favourite sound at the moment is... I've got a garden spring. I've got a garden, and I've got mm. a garden sprinkler, and it's one of those old school kind of <laughs> ones, and I fucking love it. And I just go and put that on and sit by that. It's just nice. the greatest sound, because it is, you know, it's the sound of summer and it's what have you. But it is just a really lovely, lovely sound. Um, and if I could make it into an instrument, I would. I suspect it might be quite limited uh, appeal. Do some panning, have panning. <laughs> well, doing this, I've, I've, I have rec done some binaural recording of it. But have it, you? Oh, yeah, great. But it is, you know, essentially, it's doing that anyway because it's kind of moving around as well, doing the spitting thing. Mm -hmm. And it's great. I've, it, I've got a shed which I sit in <laughs> making phone calls, and the sprinkler on the shed um, is just a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> I could stay there all day. Maybe I should. Um, cool. That's great. Well, um, yeah, I love what you do. I think a lot of people love what you do as well. Um, it's very kind. Yeah, they are amazing instruments. And I think it's, yeah, it's great that you're doing, making different things, you know, and, and exploring sounds uh, in the natural world, you know, that is that is a cool thing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it was really good to speak to Pendle. Uh, he makes incredible things, I think. Uh, do check out his website. Um, I didn't mention at all in that interview that he's done work with uh, Spitfire Audio as well. They've also checked out his stuff and raved about it. Uh, he was also featured on Sonic State not long ago either. So yeah, there's lots of his stuff to check out and try. There are also, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, there were free things that you can get off his, uh, off his website too. Okay, that's it for this episode of Midiera Meets. And the next episode should be quite a good one, uh, as long as everything happens. Who knows? Thanks for listening. I'll see you again soon.